Okay, so we're on 106B.3, which is taper cuts and fades. So here we go. Okay, so skills that are needed for taper cuts and fades, as well as regular haircutting, like you have to know the foundation of the haircut. So you have to know the difference between like a solid form and a um, graduated form and an increased layered and a uniformly layered, as well as that, we also need to know the other techniques that go along with the shorter haircuts, like gradation, fading, where to transition and outlining. Okay, so those are the, the areas in addition to the regular haircuts that you're going to have to know the difference of. Now, granted, clients are not going to know the differences. Okay, they're going to just, one might call it a taper, one might call it a fade, and they mean the exact same thing. Um, so it's up to you to do a thorough consultation so that you understand exactly what they're talking about. So the technique that you're going to use depends on this. Um, the intended result, what's the finished result supposed to be? What's the overall length? What's the length of the shortest areas cut at, as opposed to the length of the longest areas and amount of transparency or scalp exposure that you're going to achieve. So how much skin do you see, if any at all? Remember, different colored hair, different densities. Even if you use a number two, it could look totally different depending on the color of the hair and the density of the hair. Sometimes even the color of the scalp, you know, if their scalp is lighter or darker, it could make a difference too. So remember, we have the seven sculpting procedures. We have sectioning, head position, parting, distribution, projection, finger and tool position, and your design line. So, if we're gonna section, we don't always need to section. Some of it's even so short that we're not gonna be able to section. This is the first of any sculpting procedure or anything that you do. You have to, after you do your consultation and your analyzation, you have to section. Most of the time in shorter hair, you're sectioning with your, you're visually sectioning. You're sectioning with just saying, okay, if I'm gonna only go to the ear right here, this is as far as I can go, the back of the ear. So even if you can't clip it off, you still have to do it visually. That's the first of the seven sculpting procedures, as well as adding gradation, fading, and outlining to that, or tapering, either way. So how are we gonna achieve some of these gradation or fading techniques? Well, overcomb technique is a good one to use. Whether you're using a clipper overcomb or a share overcomb, it's all gonna depend on the angle of the comb and what, or how far away you're holding it out from the head. So when we work with some of these overcome techniques and gradation, what we're gonna be looking at is what do we use? Shears, taper shears, clippers, trimmers, you know, which ones do we wanna use for the overcome technique? You can use it to create a taper, you can use it to create a fade, you can use it to help blend other areas of the hair. It just really depends on what you're trying to do. And again, that you will figure out during your consultation. Okay. So the most common overcomb techniques are going to be a share overcomb or a clipper overcomb. You could even use a taper share. So when we talk about comb control, again, it is the various size of the combs and the specific area of the head you want to work on, how short you want to take it. So if you're removing both or if you're trying to blend, just depends on how much of a, a inclination you put on that comb or how much of an angle you're going to put on that comb. What we say here with the, the flat top comb, which is that our next one, here we go, our flat top comb is used for comb control. It's also known as a clipper comb, a large clipper comb. Um, I actually like the flat top comb a lot better than I like the large cutting comb for using over comb work. So this is used to control the hair when quickly removing larger lengths of hair with clippers or shears. It's good for tapering or creating flat top haircuts. This smooth surface allows the clippers to glide across the comb easy 
And the spine on this has the same thickness as the teeth. So you don't have to worry about this being different uh, sizes. It's all about the same. So you get a nice even clean cut around the head. When we work with the large cutting comb, this is good for control when cutting large amounts of hair. It's good for overcome techniques when you want to remove bulk. And it's usually thicker at the spine, so you're not going to cut too short. It's going to give you that extra, you know, eighth of an inch thickness to where you're not going to cut too short with that. Are they having trouble with the Are they having trouble with it? Mm -hmm. I don't know. How many inches did you say? How many what? Uh, you said one eighth of an inch? Well, it could be larger. It just depends on the manufacturer of the comb, but you know, they're usually a little thicker at the spine. So it just depends on how the comb's made. Awesome. Okay. But they are they are generally thicker at the spine than they are at the teeth. Regular cutting comb you're really familiar with. This is what we use like all the time. Um, this consists of fine teeth and wide teeth. The spine on this one is thicker too than the teeth, right? It's used to control short lengths of hair. It's also used to comb and distribute longer lengths when you hold it with the fingers to cut. And um, it could be used for many other things too, styling, um, parting. I mean, that's just a general, like an all purpose comb, but for sculpting, we're gonna call it a cutting comb, okay? And then we have our barber or taper comb. Um, these are nice combs. These are thinner. They're usually are very, a little bit more flexible, like you can bend them. You can get close to the scalp for shorter lengths. Um, you can use it for sideburns. You can use it for gradual blending. You can use them for eyebrows. They're really nice to use for eyebrows, by the way. The taper end of the comb is a lot closer, finer teeth and smaller. So it's used to refine and cut in tight areas like hairlines, ears, sideburns. Um, you know, sometimes if the hair just sticks out in one spot, you might just want to cut those two little hairs. That's what you can use. Okay. So sometimes if you start with a larger comb, it's a little bit easier because it is a thicker spine. So it could be like a safety net when you start. Um, and then if you want to take it down shorter, you can use uh, more of like a flat top comb. But the overcomb technique, if you're picking a colored comb, because you know, some a lot of these combs come in different colors, right? So what this says, if you're using a lighter comb, use it on darker hair so you can see. If you're using a lighter hair, use a darker comb so you can see the hair better. Okay, so it just, it helps. It helps, let's just say. Um, I don't remember having different colored combs when I learned. So sometimes when I get a different colored comb, it kind of throws my eyes off a little bit because I'm just used to black combs. That's pretty interesting. I didn't, I didn't really think about that. What, the different colors? Yeah, making it a lot easier for you to taper or um, fade a cut. Okay. Right, yeah, because you can see the hair better. So, I mean, if someone has dark hair, yeah. dark comb, it makes it a little bit harder to see, you know, the hair. But, yeah, it actually does, it does help. So, if we're going to be using our taper share over comb, um, taper shears or thinning shears, as some people call them, or some people say, you know those, those scissors with the funny little teeth? <laughs> I've heard clients say that several times, but that's what we've got, taper shear over comb. When we're working with this, what it's going to do is help remove weight or bulk. It can even soften the ends. Um, be careful how close you go to the scalp with those, because depending on the type of hair, it could stick out or look a little frizzy. So we have to make sure if we're using these, we're going to be using these correctly. Do not use these to blend only, solely. You're going to have to take that extra weight out. If I've seen people that are just like, oh yeah, if you have this little you know line there that you can't get out, just take your thinning shears and cut it with that. So they don't even try to blend it. They just pick up their thinning shears and just start cutting the heck out of it. Um, don't do that. I mean, use it in areas where just to kind of soften it a little bit more, but get as blended as best as you can with your clipper over comb or your share over comb or whatever you're doing. And if you still have some hard spots, then go in with your taper shears. But remember, when you're working with your taper shears or your thinning shears, the space of the teeth is going to determine how much hair you take out. So the wider space teeth 
the more chunkier of a look you're going to get. It's not going to take out as much hair as a thinning shirt that has finer teeth, but the wider space ones are going to look more chunky. Where the finer ones are going to take out more hair, but they're going to look more blended. So again, it's going to depend on the type of hair that you use or that you're cutting. Um, depending on the type of shear that you use, going with the type of hair that you're cutting. Because if you have someone that has really thick, coarse hair, you know, do you want to cut it very fine or do you want to cut it just a little bit here and there? You know, that's, that's going to depend on that. If you have someone that has very fine hair and you take a really wide tooth uh, thinning shirt to it, it's going to look chunked out, like you've taken chunks of hair out. So you want to make sure that you're, you're using the ones that are closer spaced teeth so that it looks more blended. But a lot of times also, if someone's wearing their hair longer on the front, let's say, let's say they get like a zero fade and they're going to be, you know, wanting it longer on the top, but they don't want just that chopped look. Like they want something to come down on their forehead, but they don't just want that chopped look. Sometimes just going over the ends with the taper shears um, kind of softens that up a little bit and just doesn't look like it's just a straight, hard, blunt cut, you know, if they want a softer look. So, you know, all of these tools are great. Um, it's just a matter of learning how to use them correctly. I was told that you were supposed to like use those shears at a diagonal way or form, well, yeah, way, and then chop that way. Yeah, you can do like a point cut with them. You can do like a notch cut with them. Um, yeah, don't ever just go in like you're using a pair of shears and just chop the ends of that because you will see that you kind of want to go at a diagonal line or at an angle, like you said, um, and then uh -huh. just and just get like a nice chop look with them. Oh, uh, um, and then I've seen like people actually cut at the very, at the very, um, what do you call it? The exterior, which is by the scalp. And then they, they just like bring it out. At the scalp, yeah. What that's doing with the scalp is it's like, if somebody likes their hair spiky, it's gonna help give them a lot more spikes on the top. Just uh, because, okay, okay, okay. Like, cause you know how the teeth are spaced, so it's cutting like every other hair out, right? So the shorter hairs underneath are pushing those bottom hairs up. So sometimes people do it for fullness too. But again, you have to you have to have the right hair. Someone with very thin, fine hair, if you were to texturize it that close to the scalp, especially on the top, it's it's gonna look like unless they have spiky hair, you know, if they have any longer hair, it may look like it's been cut really short in spots if it's a very thin, fine hair. So like, you have could to you really possibly see the scalp if you do that with fine hair? Like if they get came out like chemo, like chemo or something? Um well, I don't know if that looks like that but it just depends on how much you take out i mean it could you know, just like uh, shears right they're but if you use them wrong you could take them down hair it's the same thing with the thinning shears you know they're great to use but if you don't use it correctly on a certain type of hair it could add you know it could look it could be dangerous it could be dangerous let's just so again we just have to really make sure that um we do rural and and consultation before we start. When you see anything like that, it's using room for it. Okay. So when we're going to go with our share over comb, when we start with this, the shears are opened and closed to remove hair extending beyond the teeth of the comb. The comb is kept in an upward motion, reflecting the intended line of inclination, while the shears are quickly opened and closed repeatedly. The following steps are used to perform the shear over comb technique. So basically what that's telling you is where are you putting the comb in, right? And what you have to do is hold the comb steady as you work up the head and follow that head. Because if you want to go straight up or do you want it to go longer? So if you want to go straight up, you got to hold that comb nice and straight at an angle and just go straight up off the scalp like that. You know, if you want it to get longer as you're coming up the scalp, you're gonna to wanna to gradually increase that length and pull it away from the scalp when you're doing shear over comb. This is why analyzation is so important. This is why knowing the way that the head is shaped and the bone structure is so important. Cause I don't know if you've ever seen people that look like um, right behind their ear, like their scalp sticks out a little bit or their scalp like has a, a hollow there. It almost kind of like goes in some. 
um, yeah, if you're going to be doing share over comb there, you know, you may have to go in a little bit tighter in there to make it look the same so it doesn't look like there's a shadow there. You know, so it's all about checking out the scalp, checking out the hair growth, and really looking at that. So you put the comb in the hair with the feast with the teeth facing upwards. You tilt the teeth of the comb back towards you to hold the hair and reflect the intended line of inclination that you're going to be rising to. Position the shears parallel to the comb. Rest the still blade of the shears against the teeth of the comb, just above the spine. No pressure, you just rest it there. And use your thumb to control the movable blade as you comb upward slowly along that line of inclination. You follow the comb with the shears in unison and you quickly and steadily open and close the shears fully and work up the panel. So as you're working, your comb and your shears, both of your hands are gonna to have to be going at the same pace up. So as you're going, you're cutting up, 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 up as you're working up. Now, sometimes our hands don't go at the same pace. So um, this does take some practice. It does take practice. You're gonna repeat the technique over that area as many times as necessary to get a nice, smooth, um, prog uh, smooth, even progression of links. You're gonna use a portion of that established panel as a guide when you move to the next side to cut. Um, when working with the diagonal comb, oh, okay, so let's say now we're going up the back, it's nice and straight. But when you get from the ear down to the corner of the hairline, you're gonna have to angle that comb, you know, because the ear, the hairline neckline goes down like that, right? From behind the ear here, it's gonna go down, so it's coming down at an angle. So you're gonna have to angle that comb. When you get to the other side, you're gonna have to angle that comb at the same angle. That's sometimes challenging too. Again, check out the hairline, check out the growth patterns around those ears. Then when you get to the side, it's the same thing. But do you start on the side or do you start on the back? Well, most of the time it's preferable to start on one side, okay? Because sides are different, you know? So start on, begin working on one side, work to the back, and then go to the other side and work to the back. The advantages of that are that you're always cutting from your guide to hair that hasn't been cut yet. And if sides are not exactly the same, then we can always make sure that, you know, because sides are not, are not the same. We know this. Ears are not placed the same on the head. You know, we know that the sides are not exactly the same. So if we're starting from here on one side and we're working our way up, we can use features like corners of the eyes, tops of the ears, you know, middles of the years, whatever feature we're going to use to make sure that we get both sides even and work our way back. That's the advantage of that. If you start in the back and you work from one side, then you work to the other side, I promise you one side's going to be higher than the other. So the advantage is to start on one side, work to the back, go to the other side, work to the back. As you start, ask your clients to confirm those lengths so that you're not cutting the hair five times, you know, cut a little bit on one side, ask them how the length is. If they like that length, then you can move on. But yeah, don't do the whole cut haircut three or four times because each time they decide that they want it shorter. So make sure that you are, are fully aware of that. Clipper over comb is more, you're probably gonna be using this more than um, the shear over comb. Okay, it's quick. It removes large amounts of hair real quick, real fast. It cuts all textures of hair and facial hair quick and evenly. So when you're doing clipper over comb or share over comb, there's some guidelines here. Um, you pretty much do it the same way, the way you hold the comb and the way you're moving around, except instead of using shears, you're using clippers. Okay, so some guidelines for this is um, use the comb, use a fluid comb movement without hesitation. Okay, so we want to make sure that we don't have, we don't like, we're not jerky, we don't have choppy motions. We have to start, we just have to flow up that head when we're using this. So when you're doing a clipper over comb, you're going to comb the section of hair with the teeth facing upward, 
You're gonna angle the comb according to the intended line of inclination and the desired distance from the scalp. You're gonna move the clippers across the comb to remove the links. Be sure to avoid cutting links below the spine of the comb. And see, that's another reason why I like those big flat top combs. Because if you hold the comb up like this and you hold the clippers and you go to go across it, the comb is actually longer than the clippers. Where some of the other ones, when you do that, the clipper extends, you know, a little bit past the uh, the comb edge, and there could be some uh, error there if you're not careful. Um, Lugo, we need to see your your handsome face there. <laughs> You see me? I'm here. I see you. Okay. So the clip overcome techniques are often performed by starting on one side and then working through the back to the opposite side for efficiency, just as with the share overcome technique. So, yep, it all kind of works the same. Some of the guidelines that we're going to be working on when we're talking about uh, clipper overcome is clippers are positioned and moved across the comb for fast length removal. Clippers can also be positioned to move upward in unison with the comb for blending. If using adjustable blade clippers, position the still blade even with the movable blade in the closed position. Work up the head using vertical sections or panels. Use each previously cut panel as a guide for the subsequent section or panel. Panel, not panel, panel. The size of the comb for clipper over comb technique varies on the area of the head and the type of hair you are cutting. Follow the same comb, comb guidelines as share over comb. To get into tight spaces such as around the ears and nape, work with a standard cutting comb or a taper comb and trimmers. Flat top combs help you control large areas, remove initial links, or create a very short square form. For damp hair, it's usually better to use pedal motor clippers, which have a stronger motor. Just want to say too, when you're using the combs, um, you don't need to use like the whole comb, you know, just use the first inch or so of that comb. It's going to help you get around the curves of the head a lot easier. And um, it just, it, it, it's like you have more control over the hair than if you try to use like all the teeth or just the teeth in the middle. And the way you hold the comb too is a whole nother thing. You know, sometimes when people hold the comb, they have like this grip on it that it's gonna, if they don't hold it super tight, it's gonna like fall out of their hands, which, you know, we don't wanna do that. We wanna make sure that we're holding our comb in a, in a nice uh, loose grip where we can flip it around up and down as we need to comb and cut and comb and cut and comb and cut and comb and cut. It, it makes a difference. It really makes a difference. So, um, all of it, you know, you just got to get used to the tools. There's going to be some some clippers you like better, some as you're finding out. There's some combs that you like better. Um, some of the combs too, the way they're made, you're going to like them better for certain types of hair. You know, you may have a comb that you like for fine hair and a comb that you like for coarse hair and a comb that you like for dense hair. I mean, there's all different types of hair. So you're going to have a variety of combs. Um, for me, it's a round brush. I have the hardest time finding round brushes that I like the way they flow through the hair because sometimes it seems like they just get stuck or the bristles are too short or the bristles are too long or they're too far spaced apart, you know, but then again, that brush might be good on a different type of hair, which it is. I know it is because I've used it before. It's just not good on my hair, but round brushes are my, my downfall. So remember that about combs and everything else. Okay, so our fading techniques is a smooth progression from complete transparency and scalp exposure to no transparency and scalp exposure versus like a shade effect. Okay, a fades, also called a fade. Um, it is a smooth progression from complete transparency and scalp exposure. So remember that you're gonna see it from nothing into a gradient of color. So it's going to be a very smooth transition. So when we talk about the different fading techniques, um, how high, how low do you go? Do you have high, you know, mid or, or low? Mm -hmm. Depends on the, the person, right? Or even drop. 
I mean, there's so many different ones out there and every single person's going to call it something different. And remember, it's not just what social media says. It, it depends on the person's age, um, what part of the country that they live in, or even the shop that they went to before could be giving it a totally different name or call it something else than what you know it by. This is why it's so important to do your thorough, thorough consultation. So depending on how you use it, those techniques are gonna come from your, your hair. So density, length, texture, there we go. All of that works from there. So you do have zones when you work on this. I know you're like, no, you don't, no, you don't. But yeah, you kind of do because if you're doing a zero, how high are you gonna do that zero? Then you do like your half and your one and your one and a half and your two, and then you just overcome it up. So how high or how low are you making each one of those zones? So a zone is defined as a progression of length and the amount of transparency achieved. Should be predetermined so that the design is well balanced and can be cut in different orders. So you can fade up or you can fade down. So do you go from the shortest zone to the longest or do you go from the longest zone to the shortest? Starting with the shortest, then cutting longest, and then you work the zones in between, or do you do the opposite? Right, so that's fading up. Fading up is where you cut the shortest zone, <clears throat> right? Um, each zone is cut a little bit longer and a little bit higher than the previous one, gradually getting longer toward the interior upwards. So of course the longest one's gonna be on the top, right? The benefits of fading up is the clipper blades are so cool when they're touching the skin. The fade line established as an early visual guide. They're more efficient since each zone gets cut to intended length and then blended. Now challenges in this are the inexperienced barber may chase the fade line. Chasing that line is just gonna make it get higher and higher and shorter and shorter. Tempting to blend upward and end up with a higher line than intended, okay? So, Depends on what you're doing. I mean, do you like this way or do you like to fade downward? Sometimes it's called reverse fading. So what happens is it's a more gradual reveal of the transparencies between scalp exposure. There's no hard lines at any point. Um, the challenges are that these exterior lines are being cut over and over again, takes longer, potentially taking longer. Um, since the shortest zone is cut at the end, the clipper, maids, clipper blades might be hot by the time they are directly on the skin and either need to be cooled with a coolant or use another clipper while those cool off. Uh, new or less experienced barbers may struggle with visualizing the desired fade result while cutting the hair. So either way is, I mean, it's a right way. There's like no right or wrong way to do this, but um you're gonna have to try all the different ones because there may be some hair that fading down works better than fading it okay so directions that our fades go all right so do we have horizontal lines do we have diagonal lines or do we have curved lines now when we're going to look at the scalp or look at the lines of the head, where are we gonna go from? We're gonna take that temple point. And from that temple point, <clears throat> we're gonna move to the axilla bone. So which area does that go for? From the temple point to the occipital bone. The temple point is this area here where all that little point comes out on someone's head. You know, a lot of times if you're doing a front head lineup, that's cut. So from that point on, do you want a horizontal line, a diagonal line, or a curved line to that occipital bone? And that's something that you're gonna to have to predetermine also during your consultation. Okay, so they have compressed lines, compressed fades, 
and then they have stretched fates. So oh, let me let her in and tell her she's in the wrong class. So you have full to no scalp exposure within a small amount of space. Your zones are a lot thinner and the appearance of more weight in the fade. Or if you have a stretched fade, it is full to scalp exposure, creating a larger or wider amount of space. The zones are thicker and there's less weight to that fade. So again, that's gonna have to go during your consultation and find out what they're, they're seeing. Um, Zulima. Yes. You need to go to Miss Janie's theory, hun. You're in the wrong one. <laughs> Can you send me the, I don't have the other one. Um, if you look back on your text messages, it should be on there. I don't, I don't okay. have it with me right away. I mean, I, I don't have okay. it handy with me, sorry. <laughs> Okay, I know how to use this. So, <laughs> okay, I will try. Okay. <laughs> um, Zulima is just trying to get on my my thing, so I think she needs to talk with Miss Janie. I just she just got off. Okay. So bald fade versus skin fade. Okay, so does that make much difference? Is it bald or if it's skin? But. Yeah, no, I mean, they say it all the time, right? But what they're saying is a bald fade is with the clipper blade closed. That's a bald fade. Tremors can also be followed by an electric razor. Okay, so that's wow. the, the skin fade they're saying is where you use a straight razor. So if you're doing a bald fade or a skin fade, do you want a straight razor or do you just want like the electric razor? Electric razors nowadays cut pretty close like a razor anyway. So um, which one is it? So a skin fade is typically a straight razor fade. Okay, so blending. Sometimes blending is very, very challenging. So zones are blended to create smooth transitions and eliminate. <laughs> Junior, is that you? Oh, my bad. <laughs> Step on Zoom, huh? Should make um, TikToks out of that. So zones are blended to create smooth transitions, eliminating any visible lines in the shaded gradient of the fade. Some barbers prefer to establish all zones and then blend, while others blend between zones as they progress up the haircut. Um, blending is achieved using various techniques, including clipper guards and attachments. C-stroke, also known as arcing the clipper away from the head in a curved movement with or without guards, or notching, using just the very corner of the clipper blade or the tips of the shears to remove very small amounts of hair. So whichever technique you choose for blending, just know that like blending is important, right? So when we talk about these clipper attachments, you have to know like the order that they go in and then how to use the adjustable lever to make them longer or shorter when you're gonna be working with them. So, I mean, you have no guard, which is just the, the blade closed and then you can open it and have a totally different length. You can open it halfway and get a different length there also. So you have a number one, which is, what is it? A one eighth, right? One eighth, yes. Right, you're right. Yes. One eighth. The one is one eighth. A two is one quarter. So one and a half is three sixteenths. Then you're going to go to a one quarter to uh, a three eighths. Wait, let's see. One eighth, three sixteenths, one quarter. Three eighths is a three. One half is a four. Um, five eighths is a five, six eighths is a six, seven eighths is a seven, and eight eighths or one inch. Eight is one inch. So you should know that. You should be able to like just say that. Um, a lot of Where do you see those measurements at? Huh? Where do you see those measurements at? 
in my brain, but they're on the cover oh. itself. I memorized it, see, so you should memorize this stuff. Okay, so so half, for me, the half is a student. The half guard is 116. I get it. Okay, so you're, right. you just gotta like memorize it and know. Um, we, a lot of times we go by numbers. Like when we talk, when people come in and we ask, you know, hey, what, what number do you know, I wanna fade? Okay, what number do you usually get? And they'll go like, number two on the top, you know. And then you get some people sometimes that do some weird stuff and they're like, oh, I want a one, two, three. Or, you know, I want like a two, four, six or an eight, two, four, eight. I mean, weird stuff they're gonna ask. Or they say it backwards. Oh yeah, they want a three on the top and a one, or a three on, a one on the top and a three on the sides. Yeah, we've heard that before too. Um, but just know, you're just gonna have to know that, you know, this is what somebody told them somewhere. It's not like they've ever done it to know that a one, five, eight is what they want. Like that makes no sense anyway. So, you know, uh, we'll just have to, to know the numbers and be aware of the actual links of the numbers. So if someone says, you know, one, five, eight, and you're like, you're going to go from a one eighth to a five eighths to an inch, like that would be like three lines in their hair. Cause how, how would you blend some of that out? So yeah, they'd have three layers for sure. So um, we just have to know the actual numbers that we're working with. The number system is not universal. So some brands of clippers may be a little bit different. So just make sure that whichever clippers you're using, that you know the length and the guard and the other brands of clippers. I know Anderson walls run pretty close together, but some of the other ones may not. So just be familiar with these guards and the links that they represent. The C stroke is an arcing movement that you're going to use the uh, move the clippers and a curved movement away from the head. It works primarily for blending. It's not going to put a hard line in it. But when you're going to be using this arcing technique, you can get the hair really uneven if you do not um, keep the heel, which is you know the bottom part of the blade, on the head as you come up and then arc off. So come up, stop, and then roll it off like roll it off the head don't just flip it out like that because you're not getting that that c stroke you're not getting that curve to it that you're looking for and yeah we need to have that definitely need to have that for blending okay notching is where you're you're kind of using the just the tips or the blades tips of the shears or the tip oh my gosh can't even talk Tips of the, the clipper. Yeah, there we go. So when you're going to blend with clippers or when you're going to notch with clippers, what you're going to do is open the clipper blade, setting it slightly more longer than the setting used in the shorter zone that's being blended. You're going to position the corner of the clipper diagonally at the intended weight line, and you're going to use short C strokes to remove weight and blend zones. So it's almost like you're using an eraser, you know, when you erase on paper and you kind of go back and forth like that, except you're going to be sort of just flipping this, the C thing out a little bit more. So you got to be patient when you're doing this though, because you're only cutting like two or three hairs at a time because you just want to get that little tiny bit. So you want to get the most out of it as you can. So that's a good technique to use for that, especially in areas where bones may hollow out. It's an easy way to, to get in there. So you might encounter clients with irregular density, wrinkled scalps, creases, whirls, indented areas, scars, right? They can all make hair look darker or create a patchy appearance. So use the technique to create the illusion of more uniform density and links to create a look of a perfectly blended appearance. Notch cut to the ends of the strands at the scalp, use the corner of the clippers in a crisscross or cross hatching pattern until the area is well blending. So cross hatching or hatching is a new word probably for some of you. And this term is based on drawings or etchings that uses intersecting sets of parallel lines. So in other words, you're just doing like a crisscross on there. Okay, this creates the illusion of light and shade. Similar movements with the corner or edge of the clippers can be used to diminish weight or unwanted lines. So you're just kind of going like crisscross, crisscross, crisscross applesauce. You guys never did that though when you were in elementary school, did you? So this one, 
we need to really um, pay attention to that because you could actually cause damage, um, cut too much if you're not careful when doing that. Sometimes instead of doing a crisscross, a lot of people do like a little circle motion too. Okay. So when we're gonna be transitioning, fades are usually seen as two components or two distinct areas. You have the fade area, which is usually the back and the sides, right? And then you have the top or the interior or the crown, which gives the cut its shape. Okay, then we have our transition area, of course, that connects those two together. So if you think of the term shade or shape, um, it could help you envision what you're going to be doing in the end. So these are some different techniques that you can use for your transitioning areas. You can use the share over comb, the clipper over comb, or the clippers with detachable blades or guards. When you're using sure over comb, it's usually done for on straighter textures with longer interior lengths, um, such as comb overs, pompadours, etc. Always allows options for a more gradual approach when transitioning, and taper shears may be used after if more blending is required. Clipper over comb is usually performed on straight to curly textures with shorter interior lengths. Two common methods are to position the comb with the desired angle, connecting the fade area with the interior. Another way to do this is the same technique as above, but with guards for extra safeguards against the cutting the hair too short or too quickly. I know y'all like to watch all this, these haircuts on YouTube, but um, really watch what they're doing because some of the techniques that they use, that's the technique that works really well just for that particular head that they're doing on YouTube. That's why they're doing it on there because it looks great when they're done. Um, but you can't do some of those things on everyone. So really start paying attention to some of the things that you're, you're watching and how they're doing it. Because yeah, it might look really nice. And movies you gotta buy. Yeah, that doesn't always mean that. Um, it's gonna be that. Some of them you gotta buy, you gotta check in some of them. Sorry. In the end. Okay. So if we're going to use detachable blades or guards, we can perform this with all textures, but most often performed with curly hair. Um, textures with very short top lengths. Detachable blades or guards increase in size as they do the work for you. Position the clippers diagonally to cut either with or against the grain for blending. Okay, so now we're gonna go into the grain of the hair. So the grain is the direction in which hair grows. That's a test question, by the way. What is the grain of the hair? The grain of the hair is the direction in which the hair grows. Cutting with the grain works good for tightly curled hair to avoid cutting too close to the scalp or creating uneven links due to the curl. Hair is brushed with the grain prior to cutting. Um, it also works good for beards too when they wanna keep their beards full but not um, have some of those excess hairs sticking out if it's a coarse beard. So that really helps a lot with beards. Uh, cutting against the grain cuts the hair closer or shorter than cutting with the grain. Huh? I think that should be backwards. Cuts the hair closer or shorter than cutting with the grain. Cutting against the grain, oh yeah. Okay, maybe I should read that right, huh? Cutting against the grain does cut it shorter. So we have our outlining techniques. Okay, so we can argue about outlining techniques all day and night for years and never come to a agreement. Um, not every technique is going to work for every person. You can use shears. It's gonna look more natural. It's not gonna have a clean line. It's gonna be less defined. It usually works better with long hair. It does, it works much better with long hair. Um, so you won't see any transparency. Short individual cuts with tips of shears to accommodate curves at the hairline. Okay, that's what we're gonna get with outlining with shears. Trimmers or outliners produce clean, more defined lines 
hard straight lines. Lightly place the teeth of the trimmer on the skin, then move away from the line. Curved lines work with the edge of the trimmer blades in small increments and short curved movements. Be careful when you're modifying your trimmers because you don't want them to bite that person and they'll end up bleeding. And then we don't, that's a whole nother story. Um, with the straight razor, it's done after trimming and outlining, creates a sharp, very sharp defined line. Wet skin or use shaving products. I know a lot of you like that dry shaving, but uh, that noise is like a fingernails on a chalkboard. Stretch the skin and use short strokes. Not appropriate for all hair and skin types and avoid shaving against the grain when you do this. Ooh, sorry. So when we go to do the nape, are we gonna do a square? Are we gonna do rounded or tapered with no line? So angular, also known as squared, achieved with the shears or trimmers, we're using trimmers against the skin. We can do a curved shape or a rounded shape achieved with shears or trimmers against the skin and the no line taper over comb or freehand techniques like a taper with a clipper, often combined with a defined line at the sides of the nape. And then we have our neck shave. Now a neck shave is something that you're gonna to have to do at stay board. So a neck shave consists of behind the ears along both sides of the neck and the bottom of a neckline. That's a test question somewhere is like, what does the neck shave include? And there's all these different things, but it's behind the ears along both sides of the neck and the bottom of the neckline. So it's the little squarish or roundish area from behind the ear down that hairline across the back of the neck. Sideburns, okay, how do they like their sideburns? That's something that should be determined during the consultation also. Perimeter sideburns can be however you really want them. Um, wait, let's go back to the next shave for a second. Um, left side of the next shave is going to be that reverse backhand stroke that you're going to have to do at board. The other side is a free hand and across the back of the neck is a free hand. So, you are going to have to treat the neck shave as if you were doing a face shave. So again, it's lather, steam towel, re-lather, shave, steam towel, um, toner, and you can place powder on it if you want to, but we'll just do toner after that. That is your neck shave and it is done during the haircut portion of the shave. So Sometimes we have a hard enough time going to the left side using our backhand stroke. So let's uh, practice that reverse freehand and make sure we've got that down along the hairline on the back of the neck. I know you're using a mannequin head at Sabor. It's gonna be a little different than it would be on a real person, but you've gotta be able to get that, that stroke down. Um, so that might be something to work on when we come to school this week, those of you that need to work on things, um, which all of you need to work on things, but yeah. So, sideburns, ears are never placed on the person exactly the same, so use the ears as the starting reference and then go back. Don't use like an eyes or nose or corner of a mouth or something like that. Use the ear area first and then go back and refine it. Every time I've used the nose or the lips, I've been way off. So when I started using the ears as my references, I got a lot more even that way. So let's go ahead and, and try that. If you're going to outline around the ear, this is also called arcing. This is that nice little area, the curve around that ear, the C-shaping that goes around the air. That is showing us shears, but um, more than likely we're going to be using trimmers. We're not going to use shears. We're just going to use trimmers. When we get to the front hairline, not every single person likes a lineup. So it must be balanced. Do not push back the hairline. It will create a thicker line when it's growing out, or it could be a thinner line when it's growing out and people are not going to like that. 
at all. Julian, you still with us? That's what I thought. No, he's there. The, the chair moved. Uh -huh, sure. Um, so again, we want to make sure that we're using something on the skin to protect it. Sometimes if you're going to be doing it, well, not sometimes, all the time, if you're going to be doing a razor outline on someone, that is an add-on service. That is something that you should be charging extra for, you know, because you have to use extra products um, as far as shaving cream goes and an antiseptic or an astringent when you're finished. All of that type of stuff is something that's going to be just a little bit more. So yeah, you do charge extra. What if they want that dry shave though? Like, I would totally try to talk them out of it. I mean, some people do like it though, but I would, I would definitely uh, try to talk them out of that and just be like, no, 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 because it's such a, ugh, it's a creepy feeling to me. Okay, so freehand techniques. Eyes and hands are the only means of control, so you got to have a steady hand for this. This one's gonna help you just sort of do maybe a little bit of cleanup of residual strands, um, refresh the shape of a longer, tightly curled haircut, clean up the perimeter lines, create less defined perimeters when whorls and growth patterns are a concern. Okay, if you're gonna be doing clipper cutting, um, a lot of times the sides and back, you'll use that C-stroke shape hair into distinct geometric shapes. Okay, so you guys all have your homework. In order for you to get your six hours for today, you have to do that homework. Take a picture of it and send it in to us. Um, bring it in when you come in if you're doing it, writing it out by hand, but at least take a picture of the first page and send it in to us so we can give you the six hours for today. You're gonna need it. Can you send me the homework, Miss Connie? I didn't get it. Yes, I will find a picture and send it out in that text message, okay? So, um, yeah, I'll have to do that later on, but yes. Okay, so. Oh, I missed the first one. So how do I start on number six? True or false? Overcome techniques are standard techniques for cutting gradation in long haircuts. True. Mm -mm. I'm going to say false on that because it says long haircuts. It's kind of hard to do overcome. Yeah, overcome. In a long oh. Yeah, it's kind of hard to do an overcome haircut. True or false? Share over comb produces a softer edge than a clipper over comb. True. A fade creates a smooth progression from complete transparency and scalp exposure to no blank, 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 and blank, blank. Where's the temperature? Where's the temperature? The creates a smooth progression from complete transparency and scalp exposure to no transparency and scalp exposure. Areas that define the progression of links and the amount of transparency achieved in a fade are transition. I don't know. Smooth transitions without any visible lines and shaded gradient of a fade are achieved by, yeah, tells me we need to study. The method of arcing the clippers away from the head in a curved movement is called a C stroke. Yeah. The area that connects and blends the faded links and the longer interior links. Prital. Um, that would be where you're at if you were at like a higher fade. That would be the area of the head. But would be the fade line or the line, the fade line. Transition? I don't know, I just think it's all, it's all gonna be transition. <laughs> the term barber is often used to describe the direction in which the hair grows is the, I'm gonna say that's the grain. The cutting technique used to define the perimeter hairline is called, we call it a lineup, but yeah. Another name given for outlining in front, around, and then behind the ear is referred to as yeah, so we call all that stuff line up, or let's line up. So let's see what we say. We have false, true, oh, scalp exposure. Okay, zones, ah, 
zones. Blending. Sea stroke, transition, grain, outlining, and arcing. Okay. So, yeah, that just goes to show us that we need to study, right? So, tomorrow we have, we should be able to get through this tomorrow. So, plan on taking a written test. Thursday. Bro. Yep. So your written test is on Thursday because we'll be able to finish this tomorrow. So it's 106. It's 106 B and it's going to be one through five. So yeah, plan on taking this test on Thursday. So until then, um, you guys have fun. And I'll see you oh, tomorrow. Who's that? Same time. Some stranger. I don't know. It's only halfway here anyway. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so yes. yeah. Julian? Yeah. I haven't seen him in like three weeks. I've seen him for like an hour. <laughs> no, about 30 minutes. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's your boy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's your boy. Trying to stop this recording. <laughs>